gone for, for quite a while to actually get to this point today. We've got a number of people out, but that's okay. And today is the, what we've been working towards. And you'll see this as we read through this verse, because everything is so that, in order that, to get to today. And so that's what we're going to look at today. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. How many of you would, this morning, you would pray with me and just say, you know, I just want God to speak to my heart. Yeah. Amen? You with me this morning? Uh, well, let's open up our hearts and let's ask him to speak to us. Father, I recognize that if I speak and you don't, nothing's been accomplished. Lord, we need to hear your voice and our inner spirit. We need to know that you're speaking to us. Challenge us. Help us to step up, help us to be people of the light, people who aren't afraid to face truth and, and let your, your, your light speak to us and challenge us to be the people that you want us to be. Thank you for your grace and for your goodness. Everybody said, amen. amen. So here we go, Colossians chapter one, verses nine through 14. It says, for this reason, since the day I heard about you, have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So just so you know, when someone says, I haven't stopped praying for you, <laughs> that might mean something, right? You know, someone comes up to you and says, you know, I haven't stopped praying for you. You might have to think, oh. <laughs> Right? Okay. So they were dealing with a lot of um, a lot of weird doctrine in their church. So then we go on to what's going on. Heaven stop praying. We pray this. In order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. How many like that part about growing in his glorious might? Amen. Yes. Amen? And so that's really important because but we have to realize that all of those things come because we're bearing fruit, we're growing in the knowledge of God. And power without that knowledge is a scary thing. It's like giving <laughs> it's like giving a bunch of 10-year-olds M80 firecrackers. <laughs> yeah, it's a scary thing. So and it, and it goes on and it says, so that you might have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks. To the Father. I don't know about you, but I certainly can use um, endurance with, with joy. Amen? Amen. Um, I did a devotional in hospice this last week, and I said, there's two ways to wait on God. You can wait on God like I used to wait in Costa Rica, because sometimes you, you don't pay bills by check. You go to that place, you stand in a line, you walk in, and there's nothing that fills your heart with more joy then when you walk into the utility company and you see this line doing this, oh. and you just walk to the back of it, <laughs> you know, and you're thinking about all those pastors who say, well, what did you do today for the Lord? I paid a bill, one bill, you know, because it took like three hours to get there. It took an hour to park the car, you know, another hour beating your head against the wall when you got home because you were so frustrated. Well, that's not waiting on God. Some people think that's like, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, but we talked about it last week. Remember, we talked about that we go we go fishing. Come on, amen. We go fishing, and if you've watched other people pull out big fish, and you go there, how many of you are willing to wait all day long to catch a humongous, record-breaking halibut? Oh, hallelujah! Well, that's the kind of waiting on God that we're talking about—that expectancy, that excitement. That joy, because we know if God is for us, come on, who can be against us? He wants us to catch a fish. Now, that doesn't mean every time we're going to catch a fish, but waiting on the Lord means that we have this expectancy on God that he's got something up his sleeve for us. Amen? Yeah. And I like that kind of waiting on God. Waiting on God like paying a bill? Yeah, no, that's no fun at all. And then it goes on, and it says, who has qualified you? And this is where we are today, to share in the inheritance. How many of you would go, oh yeah, yeah. I want an inheritance. <laughs> well, this is where we're at today. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance. Now, let's just pretend. You've just gotten a letter that says, please appear before the office of the Schindler and Smacky. Sorry, it's the quickest lawyer name I could think of. 
And we want you up here for this day. And you're like, know yourself. And it's and they put on there, it's about your aunt Methuselah, who died six months ago. And you're like, I wonder what I'm gonna get. <laughs> of course, you've got pure minds and hearts, and you don't think like that. <laughs> but we all file in there. And and the first thing they do is they say, well, can I see who you are? And you show a driver's license, okay. Well, I just want you to know something. According to what we read right there, you've been qualified for an inheritance. How many of you are now, your, your level of happiness and joy has just increased a few notches? <laughs> he has qualified you for an inheritance. Now, I know we would think, well, when I get to heaven, well, this is talking about a different kind of inheritance that's right here, right now, that we get the moment that we receive Jesus into our life, the moment that we repent, the moment we give our heart to the Lord, the moment we say, I'm going to trust you with my life, he qualifies us for that kind of inheritance. And then it says, to share the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light, <clears throat> which gives us an idea of the inheritance right in and there. We've been called <clears throat> to be a part of the kingdom of light. Number one. The second one is that, excuse me, a part of that, it says, He's rescued us from darkness, brought him into the kingdom of the sun he loves. And then it says, In whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Now, that's that's an amazing thing. I, um, I love, you know, Debbie loves pirate movies, and sometimes I really love, you know, those old night and, and thing movies, you know, with the, the guys with the sword. <laughs> You know, Jamie mentioned a while back about the Princess Bride. I, I just think those things are kind of cool, you know? And, I mean, they, they, the, 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 those guys, when they fought, it wasn't like they're 300 yards apart shooting each other. They're facing the guy one-to-one. -one. I'm like, yeah, yeah, go get him, you know? Well, he's called us to this kind of kingdom, the kingdom of light. And so it's really important that we understand that we have a kingdom. We have a king. We have a kingdom. And... Now, you've all heard of, excuse me, I have to say this name, Lancelot. <laughs> What's the name of the king? Arthur. King Arthur. And we all have heard of that, you know, Guinevere. No. <laughs> well, you know, why is it that, that they're, everybody gets so captivated by King Arthur? Why is it, and I'll give you some examples of it, because first off, if you watch movies about King Arthur, it was always a good cause. It was never a selfish cause. He, they, as a kingdom, they swore to protect the smaller villages, to help out. Um, there was always a good cause. Everybody felt a part, didn't they? It was not like, you must do as the king says. They had knights of a round table because it was a circular thing, because they all felt like they had an investment, that they were a part of it. Is it starting to sound anything like us, maybe? We have a part in this kingdom. Amen? Amen. It's not just a long table like the, the, it's a round table. Because the Bible says, I don't call you servants because the servant doesn't know what his master's doing. I call you friends because you do what I ask you to do. We're all in the same boat together. So it's a good cause. And then not only that, but... You know, someone has issues, their feelings, they matter. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to serve a king to where if, if I'm having a bad day, anybody ever have a bad day? Yes. You know? Or if I'm having a bad day, the king, he, he identifies and he goes, man, I, I get it. I understand what you're dealing with. If you ever have a bad day, you can get before the Lord and he'll encourage your heart. Yes. Amen? And, and so it's an amazing thing. You talk about King Arthur. King Arthur's got nothing on Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know? My feelings mattered. Um, he can, the Bible says he can identify with my weakness. In my weak areas, he is made strong. What a powerful thing that is. Um, it was a, the King Arthur's round table. It was a cause bigger than, uh, you joined a cause that was bigger than yourself. You, 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 you ever, you know, in this church, the, one of the things that I love about smaller churches is that everybody can make an impact on their local church. Amen. Amen? You know, you might say, well, it's a small impact. I don't, every impact is a huge impact. Amen? 
And so we identify with a cause that's bigger than ourselves. Right now, as we speak, this broadcast is going out all over the United States, all over the world. And that's there because people like you are faithful to this church. We have music, we have people, we have people who step up, we have um, um, PowerPoint helpers. Yay, yay, woohoo! <laughs> Case up there, <laughs> Phyllis, come on, you can do that. <laughs> yes, and we have people who do sound, and so it, everybody has an impact. And we so appreciate everybody who connects and goes, this is my fellowship. Um, then not only that, you know, it's one thing if you have the idea and the concept that, you know, the king walks through and everybody's like, ooh, that's the king. But we have a humble king, you know? Humble king. He puts, he puts our needs above his own needs. The Bible says he didn't come to be served, he came to serve, which tells us that we should emulate that. Amen? And so that's an amazing king. I, I'm willing to give my life for a king like that. You with me this morning? That's an incredible thing. He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. Come and you'll find rest for your souls. I want to serve a king like that. That's, that's an amazing thing. And he will not lead us in any place where he himself has not gone or is not willing to go. You might go, well, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Oh yeah, except Jesus. Amen? You know? Yeah. He identifies with our pain, our hurt. You might go, well, nobody gets what I'm going through. Oh yes, he does. Be willing to spend some time with him. Be willing to talk to him. And pretty soon you'll understand that he identifies. Well, I don't know about you, the idea and concept that we inherit a kingdom like that is an incredible thing. You know, it's an incredible thing. So we want to look at one more verse that identifies with this idea of, of inheritance because Paul uses this pretty consistently in scripture. The idea of an inheritance. We've received something that we didn't work for. You know, we get something that we didn't earn. And it's, that's an amazing thing. You've been called into the lawyer's office and he unrolls the, the will and says, you've been given a kingdom. Ooh, man, you know, order some cake. That's party time. And so here we go. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined to the purpose of will. Now, that word predestined doesn't mean that, you know, you looked ahead and you saw this thing. It's like, you know, it's going to happen anyway. Predestined means that he's got amazing things in store for you. Amen? Don't make that word something that's not. He has predestined you for great things, according to what we see in Scripture. And it says, to the purpose of him that works through all things according to the counsel of his will. And so that, and there's that word again, we were the first hope in Christ, that the praise of his glory. In him you also heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed on him and were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit who's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So we've got this promise. We've been to the lawyer's office. He's talking about until we get that possession into the praise of him. Well, we go back to this verse where we look and we see that there are inheritance for us today so that you may have great endurance, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. We've been given the kingdom of light. That doesn't just talk about in the future. That's talking about right here, right now. The kingdom of light. And so we look at that, and that's an incredible thing. That kingdom of light, that we are the people of light. Amen? Amen. What does that mean, that we're the people of light? It means that when truth gets spoken to us, we don't go, you know, my son got me this amazing little tiny flashlight that you know I made the mistake of turning it on looking at it and for the like the next five minutes I was blinded <laughs> so that idea that I concept we are people of the light sometimes his light shines in, in an area of our lives and we go ah, no not that <laughs> but how many of also know that he's the God of all mercy and comfort amen he, he we're people of the light we're not afraid of the truth. Sometimes the truth costs us, but we're not afraid because we are the people of light. Come on, y'all. Who are we? People of light. 
were people of light, were not afraid of darkness. Now, in modern times, you know, we don't know what it's like to absolutely be without light. You wanted light? Go light a candle. You don't have a match. Matches, when were they invented? Somebody? <laughs> yeah, maybe the last 100, couple hundred years. There, you know, strike anywhere match. I was in a cave in Tuckaloochee Caverns in East Tennessee, and we're there, and he shuts the lights off. Whoa. It's a weird thing, because first, for a while, your eyes are like, you know, almost seeing things that aren't there, because they're trying to see, and then your eyes begin to adjust. I imagine your pupils are like this big. Then he takes out a single match, and he lights it. He's in a cavern that's twice the size of a football field. He lights it. And that one single match lights up the whole cavern. Wow. And so I want to tell you something. God has called us to be people of the light. Sometimes people react to us and we think, they don't like me. They, they, don't, they don't like me at all. Well, guess what? They're not reacting to you. They're reacting to Jesus. They're reacting to the light. Sometimes we say things, you know, and we might say something that might hurt somebody, but sometimes... It's not always us that they're reacting to. Sometimes they're reacting to the light, you know? We are people of the light. We, we have to not be people of darkness. It says he's rescued us out of darkness, which gives us this idea that we got to be willing to go towards the light. We're not just hide out in the shadows. Sometimes people get saved, and they're playing with the idea of, yeah, I'm just going to hide out here in the shadows, you know? You know, I, I'm just going to be comfortable. I, I, I'm going to do my best not to talk about people who sit in the back row. I'm just going to say it. But sometimes... <laughs> so, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, Cliff. <laughs> but sometimes, in a, in a spiritual sense, we like to hide out and just not be out there. Not be. I don't want anybody to see me. I, I don't want to be made uncomfortable. Um, I remember um, a guy a few years ago who told me, Pastor, I love the church, love what God's doing in my life, but don't ever ask me to do anything up front. We won't say who that was, but y'all get the idea about that, right? Sometimes we're just comfortable with it. But the, the more that he pulls us in, the more we realize, hey, we want to shine like he shines. Amen? Because that's what he's doing in our hearts and our lives. And it's exciting because we are people of the light and God's called us. And the scripture tells us in, in John chapter one, that says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with, um, with God and all things were made through him and without him, not anything was made. Jesus was there in the very beginning and it says in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness. And then darkness has not overcome it. There's another verse that talks about not the, 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 the people. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend the light. First John, here we the same author, that says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Amen? I don't like movies to where all of a sudden you're watching and the main hero ends up being the bad guy. I want the bad guy to be the bad guy, you know? I mean, come on, really? I love it when the bad guy turns out to be the good guy, yeah! But not when the good guy ends up becoming the bad guy. I love to see people step up, character development. But it says this, it says, if we, if we have fellowship with him, um, while we were in the, uh, um, with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie. We lie, it says. We can't just not be involved. We have to let him shine to our lives. Amen? And this is, we, we do not practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Yeah. Through the years of ministry, I've had people who've come up to me and say, Christians should not sin. Yeah. <laughs> right? I agree with that. 
He goes, we should never sin. Okay, where are you going with this? And then they start presenting themselves that it's all about themselves and not sinning. I want to tell you something. The more I live this life for, for the Lord, the more I realize it's all about Him. It's not about me. It's not about me being perfect. It's about Him, His perfection, His goodness, His light. I'm drawn to Him, and the more that the closer I get to the light, the more I go, ooh, that's not good. I need to change work on that, you know? Um, I'm no longer working on belt buckles on the floor. I have other areas that I have to work with. Debbie the day looks at me and goes, you are paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's important for us that we, we learn to walk in the light. That we're not just going, no, I, I'm, I'm paying attention, you know? Let the light that's presented to us, that we learn to walk in that and learn to grow in that, learn to become what God says. Because we are people of light. Who are we? We like the light. We're not just going in the darkness because it's so much more comfortable. Being in the light is painful sometimes. You ever walk from your inside of your house to the outside of the house. What's it feel like for the first few seconds? You know, is the, you know, like the zombies and they're afraid of the light and the vampires. You know, and then your eyes adjust. I don't know about you, but. I kind of like being outside in the light, especially when it's not 90 degrees, you know. It's an amazing thing. You can see things. You can connect with things. I was in my backyard the other morning, and I heard turkeys. I'm like, oh, that's cool. About two months ago, I walked out the back door, started walking, looked over to the left, and there was this wild turkey that I'm, I'm not exaggerating, even though I'm prone to exaggerate because I'm a pastor or a fisherman. But there was this wild turkey that his back was like that. I've never seen one that big in my life. But holy cow! And the thing took off. <laughs> it was the biggest thing I've ever seen. Well, walking on the light, we get to see things. We get to experience things. We get. We need to stop being afraid of of the light when people speak to us. When we, you know, not hiding from truth and letting the the reality of truth hit us head on and go, yeah. That's a good thing. There's some areas in my life I need to work on. Y'all y'all with me this morning? Because we are people of what? Light. Of the light. Amen? So then the next thing that we see, we see that it says not only are we the people of light, we've got a kingdom of light taking us out of the kingdom of darkness. It's, the Bible also says, in whom? In whom? In who? In him? In whom? It's him. We have redemption. What is that? We, we are people of who are redeemed. We are redeemed. Amen? Amen. Who are we? People who are redeemed. We're redeemed. Amen? We are redeemed. redeemed. Who are we? Redeemed. We're redeemed. That's who we are. We're not people who, you know, I just do my life the way I want to do it. You know, uh, you know, you go in your path, I go in my path. All paths lead to God. No, 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 no. I follow the light. I'm redeemed. I can't live my life the way I want to live it because the Bible says I've been bought with a price and I have to honor God with my body, with my life. I don't get to do as I want to do. I get to do as he wants me to do. Why? Because I'm redeemed. I, I, I become his. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. There, it says you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I don't get to do as I want to do. I think the disciples, the early disciples, when they're coming in the reality of who Jesus is, can you imagine, you know, nowadays we live in this day and this time, people go, you know, yeah, I wanna, I'd like to serve the Lord more, you know. Um, of course, I, I, on my bucket list, I'm getting to the Debbie and I when we hear the term bucket list. Let's get this funny little twitch, you know. And um, on my bucket list, I want to, um, I'd like to serve the Lord more, and I'd like to go bungee jumping, and I, I'd really like to go to Europe someday. Do you all notice that everything is on the same level, kind of, sort of like, you know? What's the problem with that? We are redeemed. Who are we? Redeemed. Redeemed. We've been bought with a price. Our life is not our own. It's not a matter of me 
we have in the bucket list. He is my bucket list. I'm going to serve him with my life. Because I guess what? 3,000 years from now, it's not going to be about whether I went bungee jumping in Europe off some weird canyon. It's going to be, did I serve Jesus with my heart and my life? It's not about me. It's about him. I'm redeemed. We are what? We're redeemed. We've become his. I've become his. He becomes mine. Amen? The Levites in the Old Testament, it says in Joshua 13, 33, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it works. It says, to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> but the Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. Just as he said to them. He wanted the Levites to have been mobile. They were the special forces, man. They went to all the places in Israel. They were those people. God was their inheritance. And you know, I see Israelites complaining through all places in the scripture, just like we do sometimes. But not one Levite complains in scripture because God's their inheritance. What an amazing thing that is. God's our inheritance. We're not our own. And we have to remember, we are disciples. We've been redeemed. We're following after him. We're not just following some great teacher. We're following after Jesus. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. He said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And, and it says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Wow. Well, that's kind of intense. What's that mean? Well, if I'm always worried about taking care of number one, I'm trying to save myself. But if I'm worried about him and I'm falling on his love and his mercy, I'm going to save my life. How many of you, you've had rough moments in the serving the Lord, but you'd never go back? You know, you'd never go back because of what he's done for us. Amen. And it says, um, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. I lost my life. I've given my life to him. What does a prophet a man if he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself? Jesus got hung up for our hangups. He got hung up to that place. You might go today, well, I'm redeemed, but I got issues. Guess what? Redeemed people still have issues, you know? But I'm grateful today that I hope at least it's not belt buckles, it's other things. You don't get what I'm saying this morning? He takes us, he deals with us, he deals with our issues, he deals with the stuff that we're dealing with in our lives. Who are we? Redeemed. We're redeemed. We're redeemed people. We've been bought with a price. Then the third thing that we see there, not only that, we are the forgiven. One cross, three nails equals forgiven. Amen? We are the forgiven. Who are we? Forgiven. Are you forgiven? Yes. You're forgiven. Amen? Now that we can do that really light, you know, but we're gonna we have to look at it. Forgiveness of sins. If we don't get that straight early on in our Christian walk for God, we're gonna be so messed up because we're gonna be trying to do things in our own strength. And we have to learn to walk forgiven. We have to learn to walk in daily forgiveness because what happens if we mess up more than once? I'm messing up again. And, and the Lord, when we ask for his forgiveness, he goes again. Because <laughs> according to scripture, when you ask for his forgiveness, he's forgotten. And we say, again, he goes, again. <laughs> we think it's all about right now and all the other stuff. He says, no, right now. I've put your, your sins in the sea of forgiveness. I've forgotten your sins. And it's important. We walk in a state of humble repentance. We, we walk in that place to where we say, he is my Lord. And in 1 John chapter 8, verses uh, through 10, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, that's not, you know, me saying that. That's the, that's the Bible. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Who are we? We're forgiven. We're forgiven. 
If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, I've learned where Christian psychology has entered into the church, and they say things like, you know, you're struggling because you made a mistake. You've, you've messed up in your life. You, you've had problems. You've had issues. Well, I just want to remind you that, you know, um, you, you need to forgive yourself. forgive you <laughs> I don't know personally it really messes with my head when I hear Christians talking like that I need to forgive myself self you're forgiven oh great thank you that seems a little bit bipolar to me because I don't really see that in scripture that's more psychology but I do see this principle in the word which I think is way better because who are we forgiven. we're forgiven 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, it says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Can we say that word, all things? All, all things. things. And it says, through the knowledge of Him who's called us to His own glory and excellence. He's called us to glory and excellence. He's called you to do great things for Him. Amen. 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 And it says, by which He has granted us his precious and great promises. Oh yeah, come on. Amen? Yeah. And it says, so that through them you might be, become partakers in the divine nature. By believing God with his promises, we begin to walk in fellowship with him. We walk in the very nature of God. It says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Y'all know what those are, right? Yeah. Okay. And it says, um, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with self-control. Excuse me, am I reading that right? Oh, so, virtue. virtue, excuse me. And virtue knowledge. And knowledge with, self there's that word, self-control. And self-control with steadfastness. I'm reading the, uh, the English Standard Version because I've been kind of reading a lot more of that lately. Uh, and self-control with steadfastness. Steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affections. Look, look at someone near you and go, hey man, I love you, brother. If it's a woman, I mean, if it's a man. I love you, sister. Yeah. Brotherly affection, you know? We care for one another. We care what happens to each other. Amen? Amen. Amen? We care what happens to each other. I get concerned when I know that someone has gone through a long series of events in their life and, and I, hey, you doing okay? Yeah, okay, good. Just want to check. Y'all you, you, have that kind of concern, that brotherly affection for things. It's important that we we learn that, we walk in that. Brotherly affection with, with love. That's love is unconditional love. You don't earn it. Otherwise, it's not love. It's 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 a payday. Brother, love, unconditional love. And then it says, for these qualities are yours. Good time to say amen. And it says, and are increasing and keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be effective and fruitful in my knowledge of God. Amen? And then it goes on and it says, if these, um, and it says, unfruitful in our knowledge, it says, whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted that he is blind. Ooh, come on now. Blind, having forgotten he was cleansed from his former sins. Yeah. Oh. Whoa. Wait a minute, I, I, but I forgave myself. It tells us here that what can happen in a believer's life. We can forget that we've been forgiven. And how do we forget? Because we really don't believe that he forgives us. People love to remind us of our failures. Amen? You messed up. Just letting you know. You messed up. But according to this, we are forgiven. Yes. You with me this morning? Yes. We are forgiven. Who are we? Forgiven. We're forgiven. We forget that we've been forgiven. So we, you know, we mess up. We gotta try harder. We try harder, we mess up more. Anybody? You try to make up for when you messed up and you make it worse? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here it says start from the beginning. 
Remember that you've been forgiven. Stop trying in your own strength and just do it because you want to love God and love somebody else. Love the Lord and, and walk in that place of forgiveness. Stop trying to go, I forgive you. <laughs> Playing games with yourself and just go, I am, come on, forgiven. I'm forgiven. It's over. It's done. Hallelujah. It's this place where I can walk in and go, I'm forgiven in my life. I don't have to strive and work and beat my head against the wall. I'm forgiven. I walk in that place of loving trust with Jesus. I'm forgiven. Thank you, Lord. I don't have to worry about everything that I've ever done and try to make up for it. I'm forgiven. Amen. Amen. And so it's really important that that relationship with God be established. Like people will always remind you, you want to do your best for people and love them back. Amen? Amen. 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 So then it says, therefore, um, and it goes on and it says, practice these calls. You will, and it says, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. That's your sense of purpose in life. Who's called you? Who's are you? Where are you going? Amen. Kingdom of light. You're redeemed. Oh, hallelujah. It's not just about me and my world. It's about him and his kingdom. And it says, if you practice these qualities, you will never come on, fail. It says fail. For, for in this way, you will be richly uh, provided for it as an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. I get an inheritance of a new kingdom. I get that second inheritance that I'm redeemed. I'm not my own. Right. I'm his and he's mine. And then I get forgiven. Hallelujah. That's by itself. If there were no eternity, that'd be worth it. Amen. You know? But the Bible tells us that there's more coming. A rich reward in the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's more things coming. But that rich reward is the first place that we go to. And that's important that we do that. I mean, just pause and go back a little bit in that verse. Giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Gratitude. Look at verse 12, by the way. Giving thanks to the Father. Gratitude takes us right into the inheritance. I don't know about you, but wouldn't it myth you? Myth, it's a biblical word. It's somewhere between men. I'm looking there. <laughs> wouldn't it bug you a bit? You go into the lawyer's office and some guy gets this incredible inheritance. He goes, only that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the inheritance begins when we begin to be grateful and thankful. And so I want to invite the worship team to come back. And I, I want to just take, have us take a moment and time. We are redeemed. Amen? Amen. We are forgiven. Yeah. And we are people of the light. And we take a moment and just pause this morning, letting the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and our lives. We are forgiven. That by itself is a sermon all by itself. Sometimes Debbie will go, what are you preaching about? She goes, that sounds like three sermons. <laughs> so we take a moment this morning and think about when we get all three. We're people of the light. We've been brought in and drawn in like a moth to a flame and just say, hey, burn me up. Take me. I'm yours. And then we get to that place where we just go, Lord, I just want to honor you with my life because you've forgiven me. I wake up in the morning and I walk in forgiveness on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but every day for me, it's a daily experience of forgiveness. I walk in that place of forgiveness. It's interesting. It, it, that verse that we read.